Question number one is a 32-year-old woman with primary infertility for three years. Hysterosalpingography was performed and the image is attached. IVF is planned. What is the likely diagnosis? Mention two ultrasound features of this diagnosis. And what is the preferred treatment before IVF? Hydrosalpinex is a chronic cystic swelling of the fallopian tube that form following distal tubal obstruction. Causes of hydrosalpinex include BID, endometriosis, and rarely a fallopian tube cancer. Regarding gross picture, the fine fimbria and the tubal ostia are obliterated and replaced by a smooth clubbed end. Here we can see the fallopian tube, dilated fallopian tube, with obstructed distal ends. The ballooned thin walls of the elongated tubes are translucent, and the tube is typically distended with a clear serous fluid. The epsilateral ovary may be adhered to the hydrosalpinex. During ultrasound examination, a dilated tubular structure extending between the uterus and the ovaries is visualized, and the incomplete septi is seen. Color Doppler will detect no flow inside the mass. This differentiated from a blood vessel. The wall may contain nodular areas and linear folds. In a transverse section, these nodular areas will give the appearance of a cogwheel. During hysterosalpingography, the fallopian tubes are dilated, filled with contrast with the absence of free spillage. Before IVF, laparoscopic salpingectomy or proximal tubal ligation overcomes the detrimental effect of hydrosalpingus. Answer of question one, what is the diagnosis? Hydrosalpinex. Two ultrasound feature of this diagnosis, we can choose dilated tubular structure, incomplete septi, and cogwheel sign. What is the preferred treatment before IVF? It is laparoscopic salpingectomy. In the second question, we have a 27-year-old woman with a history of repeated mid-trimester pregnancy loss. Hysterosalpingography, image A, illustrate two uterine cavities. 3D ultrasound in image B was performed to clarify the diagnosis. What is the diagnosis? Mention two other methods to clarify the diagnosis and what is the treatment. Uterine septum accounts for about 55% of all Mullerian duct anomalies. However, bicornuate uterus account for about 10% of all Mullerian duct anomalies. Hysterosalpingography cannot differentiate between septate uterus and bicornuate uterus. During hysterosalpingography, we inject a dye inside the uterine cavity. X-ray will visualize the radio-opaque dye but will not visualize the uterine wall. For this reason, bicornuate uterus and septate uterus has similar picture during hysterosalpingography. 3D ultrasound and MRI, on the other hand, can differentiate between septate and bicornuate uterus. ASRM and Ishri in 2016 published their guidelines about differentiation between the two conditions using 3D ultrasound. In ASRM, we draw the interosteal line and measure the distance through the interosteal line and call it internal indentation. We also measure the angle of internal indentation and measure the external indentation if present. The diagnosis is a uterine septum if internal indentation is 1.5 cm or more and the angle of internal indentation less than 90 degree, while the external indentation less than 1 cm. And the diagnosis is by coordinate uterus if external indentation is more than 1 cm. In Ishri 2016, we measure internal indentation, external indentation, 
and uterine wall thickness, which is the thickness above the interosteal line. The diagnosis is a uterine septum if internal indentation more than 50% of uterine wall thickness. And the diagnosis is by cornate uterus if external indentation more than 50% of uterine wall thickness. Answer of the second question. What is the diagnosis? The diagnosis is uterine septum because internal indentation is more than 1.5 cm angle of internal indentation less than 90 degree and there is no or very minimal external indentation. Two other methods to clarify the diagnosis include MRI or a combination between hysteroscopy and laparoscopy. The treatment of uterine septum is hysteroscopic septum resection. In the third question, there is a transvaginal ultrasound showing an intrauterine gestational sac measuring 3 cm, and nothing else could be visualized inside the gestational sac. What is the likely diagnosis? What is your next step? And mention two other features diagnostic of early pregnancy failure. Finding diagnostic of early pregnancy failure includes a crown rhomb lens of 7 mm or more with no fetal heartbeats, or the presence of the mean sac diameter of 25 mm or more with no embryo. In addition, the absence of embryo with heartbeats two weeks or more after a scan showing a gestational sac without a yolk sac or the absence of embryo with heartbeats 11 days or more after a scan showing a gestational sac with a yolk sac. According to NICE guideline, if the crown rump lens is 7 mm or more during a transvaginal ultrasound with no visible fetal heartbeats, then seek for a second opinion and or perform a second scan minimum of 7 days after the first one before making a diagnosis. In addition, if the main sac diameter is 25 mm or more during a transvaginal ultrasound with no visible fetal pool, then seek for a second opinion and or perform a scan a minimum seven days after the first one before making a diagnosis. Regarding the answer of the third question, what is the likely diagnosis? It is an embryonic pregnancy because the mean sac diameter is more than 25 mm with no yolk sac or fetal ball. What is the next step? According to NICE guideline, we will repeat the scan after 7 days. Two other features diagnostic of early pregnancy failure, such as a crown rump lens of 7 mm or more with no fetal heartbeats or no embryo with fetal heartbeats 11 days after a scan showing gestational sac with a yolk sac. 